The rule was to fly always in formations of two or four fighters, and the basic tactic conceived by Lieutenant John Thatch became known as the Thatch Weave. You can't shoot anything if you can't bring your guns around the barrel. I would ask myself, now what should we do if we're flying along in a formation? Let's say we've got four planes, two sections, and we saw an enemy. Well, if you're if you think the enemy can outperform you, you don't turn and run, because he can catch you, and, and you'll be easy target. You turn towards him, try to keep turning toward him so he can't get on your tail. I wasn't sure how well this would work, so I went out one morning, and I got a hold of a young man named Butch O'Hare, and gave him four airplanes, and I took four. It really worked. Edward O'Hare, one of the first aviator heroes of World War II, helped perfect the art of night fighting in the Wildcat. He scored feats like shooting down five enemy planes in a single engagement. One night, he didn't come back. Chicago's International Airport was given his name. The thatch weave was so successful, the Navy made a training film teaching new pilots to dogfight using the weave as one of the tactics. The film starred none other than Thatch himself. did what they taught me to do, and it worked. Sure. But without plenty of luck, all the rules in the book aren't going to help you when you're up playing tag with those Japs. Why, the whole thing's luck. Any of those guys have been out there will tell you that. Without plenty of luck, they don't even get back to tell you. You better quit smoking those cigars. They're about ready for the fleet, aren't they? Yes, they are, sir. This is their last gunnery flight. Pretty good. Yeah, they're plenty good. I'm a little worried about them, though. I don't think it'd do any harm if you had a talk with them about this luck business. All right. If you think it'll help any, send them on. All right, sir, I'll do it. not so much of a gamble in aerial combat as you seem to think. Now, I'm not going to give you a lecture because 
Nobody can tell a fighter pilot how to meet all combat situations. But there are certain definite rules. I like to call these laws for air combat. We didn't make these laws. They made themselves in battle the hard way. And the enemy would be quick to enforce these laws. The penalty, well, it may mean more than the loss of a plane and pump. I think it would be a good idea if I could show you exactly what happened one day in the Pacific. Then you can decide for yourselves whether it's better to trust the luck or stick to the rules. You got a match? Oh, yes. yes. No, I don't, want, I don't want a light. I just want something to use for a flat top here. Here's our carrier task force. We're moving in at high speed against a strongly held Jap base. If we can catch these Japs flat-footed, that's half the battle. We can really take over. But if we allow an enemy scout to spot us and radio a contact report, we'll have to fight our way all the way in, and that will cost us plenty. We have fighters on combat air patrol, sauntering at patrol speed to save gas. They're flying about 500 feet below the clouds because we're on radio silence, and they've got to keep the carrier in sight. Take a look at this fighter section. These pilots know their business. The wingman flies step down, a comfortable distance away from his leader, so that he can cross on the back and forth when they make their turns, and so that he won't lose sight of his leader or get left behind on any sudden turn. The section leader keeps a sharp lookout through 180 degrees of horizon in the direction of his wingman, no matter whether they're flying right or left echelon while the wingman keeps a sharp eye over the other half of the horizon in the direction of the section leader. By following this ironclad rule, all parts of the sea and sky are always within range of vision of the fighter section. So far, everything is proceeding smoothly and according to plan. Suddenly, the radar picks up an enemy scout about 30 miles away. It is absolutely necessary to intercept him and knock him off before he spots the task force. Scarlet One, this is Scarlet Base. Scarlet One, this is Scarlet Base. Vector zero, forward, five, over. This is Scarlet One, vector zero, four, five, Wilco, out. One bogey, Angel Four, Range 30, Buster, over. This is Scarlet One, Wilco, out. The fighter section leader makes a sharp turn to get on the course, and the wingman stays right with him. The enemy is reported at 4,000 feet, so the section heads for the interception point, climbing to 6,500 feet for altitude advantage. Both pilots have gone over their checkoff lists on the way out, but now they double check to make sure their gun switches are on. Scarlet One, look for bandit east of you, 10 miles. This is Scarlet Two, one bulky, one o'clock, below. Alley ho, one bandit, twin engine land plane. This is Scarlet One, out. It's a twin engine land-based bomber, and it fairly bristles with armor. Fixed guns forward, and free guns above and below. Nevertheless, without a fighter escort, it ought to be cold meat. Just the same, this section isn't taking any chances. The Jap lookout doesn't see the fighters approaching. Why? Because the section is taking full advantage of every break in order to make sure of getting the snooper before he can send back a contact report. 